Welcome, everybody. I'm Shane McAllister. I'm on the developer relations team here at MongoDB, and I'm the host for MongoDB TV Cloud Connect, which streams every Thursday at roughly this time. So we're delighted to have you join us. On Cloud Connect, we talk about what's good and what's exciting in the world of all things database related and developer related topics. And today is no different. In fact, today's live stream promises to unveil the mysteries behind one of the most transformative technologies of our time, generative AI or Gen AI. But first, some housekeeping, and I've seen some comments come in already. So if you're a seasoned viewer, it's great to have you back. And if you're new to the party, it's a very warm welcome to you. So dive into our past shows on YouTube and on LinkedIn to see what we've done before. So while we're getting ready, drop us a shout out in the chat. Tell us who you are and where you're joining us from. We'd love hearing from our fantastic viewers. Plus, once the show actually kicks off and you've got any burning questions, drop them in the chat as well too, and we'll try to answer them live on the show. So. This live stream is being recorded, and we'll be hitting MongoDB's YouTube and LinkedIn post show as well, too. So if you can't join us live or life pulls you away from our stream, don't worry. The recording is there for you to view later on at your leisure. And while we're talking about YouTube and LinkedIn, don't forget, please, to like and subscribe to MongoDB's YouTube channel and on LinkedIn to follow us there as well, too. So stay tuned to all of our posts and our hottest news and shows and events just like this one. So with that all out of the way and the housekeeping, let's get on with the show. So we've had guests on before showing how to work with generative AI, how their applications are built, how to do retrieval augmented generation, such as DataWorks, how companies such as Cito AI are using AI in the maritime world and super duper DB building things on the generative AI. But behind the sleek interface and remarkable capabilities lies a world of intricate architecture and revolutionary concepts that shape the fabric of what developers are dealing with today. And as users and developers, we marvel at large language models and transformers and natural language processing and text generation and the creativity that comes from image and audio and video generation. But how often do we stop to pause and to ponder about how these came about, what the gears are involved in building these things, and what's happening behind the curtain, as it were? So my guest today, Christoph Kakol, we're going to delve deep into the neural networks that form the backbone of these marvels. And we're going to trace their lineage from humble beginnings of artificial intelligence to the cutting edge of where we are today that redefines what's possible for developers and for platforms and systems. So I hope you're going to be amazed, you're going to be enlightened, and we're going to understand the future possibilities and power as we explore generative AI. So without further ado, I'd like to invite Christoph to join me. Welcome. It's great to have you on board. Thank you. Welcome. It's great to be here. Excellent. So you're joining us from Poland. Uh, it's great to have you. And um, I suppose for our audience, before we get into the meat of today's show, um, you know, give us a little bit of your own background, your career path to date. How did you get here and how did you learn all of the knowledge that you're about to impart with us today on our show? Uh, well, my career started a long ago, like 23 years ago or so. Mm -hmm. And I've started uh, as a software engineer in PHP and .NET a uh, long time ago. So then I started to search for some interesting things because I've I graduated um, a technical university in Gdańsk in the north of Poland. And we've had there quite a lot of things regarding artificial intelligence, although it was like the end of 90s. So it was not that... Mm, uh, advanced as, is, as mm -hmm. it is today, but still it like remained in my head that I would like to uh, develop things like that. And uh, well, uh, I've started to work in Zebia like 13 years ago, uh, still being a developer, but then I started to be a DevOps engineer, a solutions architect. And now, now I'm working in a um, team of data engineers and data scientists. 
uh, and also earned a PhD in uh, speech processing uh, with the use of machine learning technologies. So I, I was always thinking about these ML technologies and artificial mm -hmm. intelligence to be a part of my life. And uh, well, that's, that's why I'm here. <laughs> Excellent. And I suppose, look, we, as I said at the intro, we've done a lot of Gen AI shows recently. And I think since, you know, November 22 or so, when ChatGPT came to the public consciousness, a lot of people are very much aware of AI. But as you rightly say, Christoph, it's, it's been around for a long time. You know, machine yeah. learning has been with us for a long time and it has a a long road. I know in the last 18 months, it's really hard to keep up with all the advancements. So I'm really looking forward to jumping into, you know, kind of the history, how we got here, how these things were made, because, you know, mm -hmm. as developers, we like playing with the shiny new tools that are available to us all the time. And we don't necessarily think about, you know, how those tools were born, how those tools came about as well, too. But before we get into that, Tell us a little bit about the day job in, in Zebia. What, what does Zebia do? Zebia is basically a software engineering company and uh, also IT consultancy company. So we have quite a lot of customers from different parts of the world. We are a global company uh, in the United States, in Netherlands, in Poland, in Switzerland, and in India, in, in Middle East as well. So in, in many, many parts of, of the world. and. Well, we do many things uh, like it might be expected from this kind of or this size of company. So not necessarily only software software engineering by itself. This is the like primary domain of, of uh, Zibia Poland, uh, but uh, also the consultancy in data, in low code, uh, in cloud transformations, in the, in modernizations and migrations. So everything which is connected with IT consultancy and software engineering, that's what we do. Okay, okay. And you've been there how long, you mentioned at the beginning? 13 years. Okay, uh, very good, very good. Quite, quite a long time. <laughs> it is in the software space, right? In the development space. Yeah. That's, a, that's a very long yeah. time indeed. So obviously they, they treat you well and you enjoy your role there. Yes. Uh, is... <laughs> <laughs> this, this, this makes things better if you if you like work for a long time in a single company then it means that it's a good company yes yeah I, i'm always i'm always impressed to hear that as well too and i'm just looking at our comments we've got a lot of people joining us from all around the world it's great to see the the breadth of countries that we're covering taiwan india chennai um san diego as well too in the us um, and I know that we first, well, I first encountered your existence in the US at AWS reInvent for us last year. Mm -hmm. You talked a little bit on our stand for us and Carissa Fuller, who's uh, head of our MongoDB DevRel community teams, had you on board to do a talk for us. What did you talk about there? Was it on the same topic as we're going to discuss today? Yes, it was on the same topic, um, but it was like limited to the uh examples of how it works under the hood uh but only about uh transformers or the architecture that stands that stays behind the uh, uh large language models uh mm -hmm. so this is only a part of the story but we know that we not only have uh llms but we also have uh, the models that can generate video or uh images and many many things and uh, hopefully we'll have uh, today a little bit more time than in Vegas uh, to tell a little bit more and a little bit in more detail to, 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 to make a full understanding. Excellent. Well, look, we, we have plenty of time on the show. Obviously, hopefully everyone can stick with us as well too, streaming live on YouTube and LinkedIn. So Christoph, um, let's get back to the very beginning You know, of this story of where we are today. Mm -hmm. I think we're gonna go back into the world of neural networks right yes but uh, before we go to the world of neural networks we have to think how these what, what actually uh artificial intelligence is to be mm -hmm. honest i cannot answer strictly to that question because i don't know what intelligence is uh, so i prefer myself to use the term machine learning because it like says what it is we learn machines we teach machines to do things or the machines uh, are learning uh, themselves. 
but yeah, what does I, I it prefer really that mean? naming structure as well too. I've heard people say it talking about AI, and they've said it's yep. neither artificial nor intelligent, and they much prefer to talk about <laughs> machine learning. Yes, that's so. true. That's <laughs> that's absolutely true. Uh, but that's a philosophical uh, question mm -hmm. or issue rather than the technical one. But of course. True. Well, AI is a marketing term, so I stick to that. Let's let's talk about Gen AI and not change it to Gen ML because it, it sounds <laughs> awkward. But the thing is what it really is. As you said, it started quite a long time ago. I could say that neural networks is like 70s, but the beginning or the basics of the components used in neural networks is 1941. Uh, so these were only mathematical concepts. But mm -hmm. the beginning of machine learning was even old, older because what we really do uh, is we would like to make a prediction of something. Either it's the price of the house or it's uh, like a type of or a variety of a given flower type mm -hmm. uh, or whatever we would like to like fraud detection or uh, forecasting the sales in, in a given uh, department of a company. It always is something about prediction. And uh, the thing is that there are two main rules about the prediction that we have to think, and they are very old, uh, and they stay with us until today, even for Gen AI. One mm -hmm. is called a generalization. So we would like to create an algorithm, you know, that would like to, that we want it to be generalizing well. So we give it a couple of examples or a lot of examples but we would like to predict something that it has never seen, mm -hmm. but not in a way that it will try to stick to the training examples that we have given sure. at the very beginning. So we try to make a well, good prediction for the new data that come into the system. But also what we would like to achieve is to minimize the error. So we would like to this algorithm to be as good as possible but mm -hmm. it will never be perfect. If you can uh, uh, show the screen that I can show the example of this kind of thinking, this is just a simple case of prediction where we have prices of houses or apartments mm -hmm. uh, depending on their area. Of course, we know that the price of the house does not depend only on the area, but these are real prices. Uh, so what we know from these prices is that these examples actually are taken from the real world and we would like to predict something that is in between, like for instance, a price of the house that has this area. We don't have an example of that. So the question mm -hmm. is what it will be. And all of us naturally see that there, there is a line of trend here or a trend line. So we can expect that this number or the, the price will grow with the area, let's say linearly, like mm -hmm. here. Mm -hmm. But the thing is that this line is straight because we want this algorithm to be generalizing well. So we don't want to predict the line to make something like that. So mm -hmm. going mm -hmm. through the training examples, it's well, it's super accurate for the training examples, but it's well, stupid in the real life, let's say it uh, clearly. And the mm -hmm. second criteria is to minimize errors. So we know that the blue line is the correct one. The green one is too far away from the training examples and the, uh, to, to, to the, uh, uh, so it's too high and the black mm -hmm. one is too low. But the thing is that we are engineers and we would like to design it in a way that it's more like a formal, definition what does it mean that the error is low so we have some formal definitions for that and all the machine learning efforts that are made is to design an algorithm that will minimize the error and generalize well automatically this is machine mm -hmm. learning it, on its very basis so sure. you can use it for uh, linear regression you can use it for classification so for instance this is an example of multiple examples of a given flower it's iris mm -hmm. it's a classical mm -hmm. example of so-called classification and uh someone measured the flowers and it me uh, the, the person measured 
the petal width and petal length, and also sepal width and sepal length. You can download these kind of data sets from all over the internet. And this is a chart that shows the given varieties of iris, depending mm -hmm. on the petal width and petal length. And we can immediately see as humans that there is a strong division here and here between the varieties. Mm -hmm. And again, we need formal ways or automatic ways of detecting this kind of division. And that's why uh, lots of machine learning algorithms in, uh, in throughout many years were developed to make this automatic. Mm, but the most efficient one uh, is actually neural network, which was like, uh, as I said, it was started in in 70s. But mm -hmm. the first concept of of the main component of the neural network called perceptron was created in uh, or developed by mathematicians in 1941. And it's a simple thing. Mm -hmm. The thing is that it's just an addition and multiplication. So you have a component that adds numbers, but before it adds it, it takes inputs like x1 and x2. It might be multiple of the, many of them. Mm -hmm. And it multiplies the input by its relevant weight and then adds them. So this one, this perceptron does actually this simple mathematical equation. There is one simple component uh, at the output of the perceptron that adds so-called a non-linearity, but it's not important from the conceptual perspective. From the conceptual perspective, it's just an addition and multiplication. You can have, of course, many inputs here. Mm -hmm. And by doing that, you can connect the perceptrons in the network like that. This is just a simple perceptron. So here is an addition, and here you have weights. Here, here. So every place here has a weight. And these weights in today's Gen AI are called parameters. So mm -hmm. whenever you speak that, whenever you say that GPT something has 1.8 billion uh, parameters or 1.8 trillion parameters, sorry, it means that it has 1.8 trillion such single weights. And the mm -hmm. goal of neural network training is to set the weights in a way that the result at the end of the network is correct. That's all. That's the conceptual goal of it. There are, of course, sophisticated mathematical algorithms to allow for the training and to, to make it working, but still, when you start with a clean network, all the weights are initiated at random. So you have just random numbers there, usually very small. And then you push examples through the network and try to update the weights so that the result is correct. The more examples you have, the more complex network is. In general, it means that it will better generalize and better minimize error. That's the whole thing. So in this example, then, you showed, obviously, the earlier chart with the, the length of the petal, for example, as one of the mm -hmm. parameters, and that across the, the three types of, of flower. Um, you know, so would it be the case that petal length in this, way, in this instance might have more of a weighting than the sepal width? And, and that's how it kind of yes. traces the pathway through this to get to the yes. type of virus at the end. Yes, exactly. That, that's the point. So the neural network actually learns how to set the weight in, in a way that some uh, attributes are more important, some are less mm -hmm. important. It tries to, what we call it, is approximate that uh, function, that black box function, which detects mm -hmm. the variety of, uh, of an iris by setting up the weights with, of course, a sophisticated mathematical algorithm. But in the middle, or in the, uh, in the engine, it just has additions and multiplication by its weights, uh, which have to be like trained. That's all. Okay, okay. And I suppose the more than it, the bigger the network is, the more computing power you have to have. That's why it's so compute or uh, compute expensive, let's say it like that. Yeah, and that was what I was going to get to because I'm assuming we're going to get, you know, there towards the end with the more recent, you know, explosion in Gen AI has yeah. been brought about by 
the ability to do this heavy compute, this massive compute at scale as well, too. So when you say, you know, it goes back to the 70s, every, well, I don't remember necessarily the, the 70s computers, but I do remember the first computers I came across. And, you know, they, they weren't pretty good at these things. But as we progressed, oh. obviously, compute is becoming uh, at scale, less costly, et cetera, et cetera. So that's really important because I would imagine this learning, the iterations involved in this, how, how many, uh, there probably isn't a normal figure for it, but obviously it takes a lot of iterations for the learning yes. to occur. Yes, we call it epochs. So, and there are of course many ways of learning. There are many uh, like hyperparameters that you can set, that you can set up when learning or when training this kind of network. So there are lots of things, but usually when you uh, when you have a problem, when you have an, something or a challenge to solve, and you see you you think that the neural network might be a useful tool for that, then it's not like it's not a simple thing to de to design the architecture of the network mm -hmm. uh, or to say how many layers should it has should it have. This is a layer. This is a layer as well. So. The architecture of a network is unknown. The size of a network is unknown. So you have to make a, you know, a lot of attempts to get to the optimal uh, mm. architecture. That's why training is so complex. And that why, that's why also it costs so much. Because if you run a training process on a huge Gen AI network, then it might fail. And, and mm. you, you just spend your money. Of course, the Gen AI network does not look like that. That's one of the features of the... Uh, neural networks is that you can design them in a completely different way depending on the problem they want to solve. It's like with images or uh, we all are familiar with the image recognition mm -hmm. uh, networks that look absolutely differently because they solve different problems. Okay, so, so we've uh, spoken about the predictions and the, and the generalization and obviously into the classification here. What's the What's the next step then that gave, I suppose, neural networks more power for what they needed to do? Well, uh, the, the next step that was actually introduced at the end of 80s or the beginning of 90s, there was a great guy called, the, there is a great guy called Jan LeCun who invented the first uh, convolutional neural network that was responsible mm -hmm. for recognition of the handwritten digits. And uh, well, the revolution made then uh, uh, was because he thought in a different way. For instance, imagine an image that you would like to classify at some point. So say if it's a dog or cat or it's a zero, one, two, three digit, whatever. Mm -hmm. Then you have a problem with this kind of uh, architecture that, we sh that, 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 that was displayed mm, a second ago. So the thing is that you can treat every pixel of an image as an attribute, as an mm -hmm. input like petal length, petal width, sepal length, sepal width. So you can take every pixel one by one and make, you know, out of this picture, square picture, mm -hmm. you can make a row of pixels. But they lose one important information, which is neighborhood. So you cannot just put all the pixels. Of course, very big neural network will probably learn to recognize uh, dogs from cats, but it will not be very efficient. So the idea was a little bit different coming from the world of graphical filters. And if we can uh, uh, bring back the screen once again, these are the sample graphical filters that are used in many graphical uh, graphic uh, mm, uh, software. So you can basically sharpen image, blur image, fine edges, and many, many more. But uh, many people do not think how they, the filters really work. And the, the, like the mystery is not very mysterious, to be honest, because mm -hmm. the thing is that the, the filters are really such matrices like here. Okay. This is a sample filter. And what do you actually do to filter the image? Assume that this is an image on the left hand side is an input image. Then you take the uh, filter and you put the filter on top of every pixel in the image. And you okay. make, a, again, a multiplication. So this is an example where we, we take this pixel of a value 4 and we put the filter matrix on top. 
the filter matrix is called the filter kernel and we mm -hmm. make a multiplication. So zero times zero plus four times zero plus three times zero and so on. Okay. At the okay. end, it has to be divided by nine because this is the number of elements in the filter and you have a result. I didn't do any division here because this was just an example, but this is mm -hmm. how it works. And as an example, I can show you that these are the matrices for the sharpen, blur, and fine edges filters. And okay. in some uh, image addition software, you can even design your own filters. So it would be useful to, or it would be a good exercise to uh, create filters like that and see if the result is satisfying for, um, for everyone. Mm -hmm. And the thing is that the, I don't know what Jan Lekun was thinking about, but I can expect that he might have th thought about how to, if we have a neural network, which approximates pretty much everything, maybe we are able to create a neural network that will learn how to create these filters to recognize images. Mm. If these filters mm -hmm. are so useful, because we can, of course, imagine a filter that blurs or sharpens the image, but maybe out there, are filters that can detect a, or make a difference between a dog or a cat, maybe. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So what he created is a so-called convolutional neural network, which takes an image as an example, and then it makes filtering. These are th three layers of filtering, and it every layer has a single filter with single kernel. And again, because we don't know what it should do, it's about that it's the training process has to learn uh, ha has to learn the filter trends the uh, filter mm -hmm. values so if we have a blurring filter we know what weights it should have but if we have a filter that should detect a dog or a cat we don't know so uh, we want to create a set of filters many many filters mm -hmm. as much mm -hmm. as needed and let the neural network to learn or to, to learn the weights of the filters in, in its kernels. And we do one more thing uh, in the following layers. We make a so-called pooling. So we make a, like we decrease the resolution of the image. It's okay. just from observation, because the thing is that even we human, if we look at something from the close point of view and we just make it a little far away, uh, we see different things. It might be that mm -hmm. we, oh, this is an image of something. And if we take it closer, we see different uh, details of the image. So this is the same thing here. So we make, for instance, three times, pull, uh, two times uh, decreasing the resolution. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Again, we have lots of filters here. And at the end, we apply a, a plain layer like it was before. And uh, we say it's a pigeon cat or a dog, for instance. And what we do, we push lots of images into this network of pigeons, cats, and dogs. Mm -hmm. We give it as a good examples, like this is a pigeon, this is a cat, this is a dog, and let the network learn the filter weights. And it was a revolution in thinking about how to recognize objects on images. Uh, here I have an example. This is a real example from one of the pages of the uh, convolutional neural network that okay. was responsible for detecting the pigeons. And here you can see that it was 16 filters at the first layer before pulling. There are 16 filters after pulling. So you can see that the quality decreased. Mm -hmm. And then you have the uh, thir third layer of filters, which has a very poor resolution. So a single pixels can be seen on the images. Uh, every filter is actually trained. So we don't know what it does in the middle. We can observe, of course, the effect uh, of, of how that filter works. But apparently, uh, these kind of filters help the network to recognize if it's a pigeon or cat or dog or whatever else. This okay, is a little so bit even, magic. Even in the lower resolution on, on the, the right-hand side there, um, how does that help it? I mean, I can, I can understand the first set to the second set, but the mm -hmm. third set? How does, how does that make the CNN better? Uh, you know, the, the thing is that the CNN is as good as its results. So if the okay. third layer will help, then it's good to have it. 
and usually it, it helps it does not work by itself of course okay. it's just okay. ha be, because at the end of the day you end up with a vector that represents the image uh, very compressed vector which you put into the flat layer of the neural network to get the information about dog cat or pigeon let's say let's stick to that example but mm. the thing is that every layer output or like for instance this image is because you have previously these images so it's yes. not like yeah. an independent picture that adds to that that is uh, by itself creating the result but it's all only uh, something that adds up to the result of the previous layers and the oh, thing okay. is that you never yeah. know. Uh, in, in my PhD, I worked with uh, lots of convolution neur convolutional neural networks, and there was a question: Why the convolutional neural networks network has this architecture and not the other? Why you use 16 filters or 32 filters? And I always said, I don't know. I just used 32, and it was better. And it's <laughs> it's more or less. I'm just a, a little bit kidding, but only a little bit. This is like, and uh, you know, you have to make a lot of attempts to to do these results. But there is one more thing about the CNNs and it's magic because it they introduced one more additional concept. Uh, if we have an image and we pushed this image through this network and we mm -hmm. ended up with a small vector, then we can treat this vector as a representation of this image. This is like mm -hmm. a compression. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But what if we could recreate the image the original image from the compressed representation like in this example this okay. is a so-called a vari variational autoencoder so we are creating a convolutional neural network which is called an encoder in this architecture we get an input image and we train it to be mm -hmm. able to decode the original image from scratch from this so-called latent representation we okay. basically create a CNN and then make a reverse CNN, which is doing uh, pulling in uh, to like increasing the resolution, not decreasing it. And uh, once I showed that to my colleague uh, a couple of months ago, when uh, speaking about these topics uh, mm -hmm. internally, he asked me, but why do we want to recreate the original image from the original image? It doesn't make sense. And uh, of course that's, that has sense because here is the compressed version of the image and it's quite often used in uh, in the, mm, let's say, in the architectures that allow you to generate images currently. Mm -hmm. uh, for instance, stable diffusion uses yes. the latent representation for generating images. But the thing is that it's even more useful. For instance, imagine a situation like that. Here you have an encoder and, oh, sorry for that. Uh, mm -hmm. Here you have an encoder and decoder but you train it on different examples. As an input, you give an image of a street, mm -hmm. and as an output, you give a map of objects on the image. Like, okay. what is a street? Where is the street? Where is the uh, sidewalk? Where is the car? Where are the trees? Where is the sky? And all of that. If you put, if you use lots of like thousands or hundreds of thousands of images mapped like that into this network, you can expect that you will have a network that is able to detect objects on the street, which is widely used in autonomous cars. And then you yeah. end up with a car that goes by itself just by introducing that. Well, on the high level, it's a very simple concept of doing things. And encoder decoder ar architectures are used everywhere right now. Uh, LLMs are encoder decoders. Uh, the image generation things are encoders, decoders, everything. Okay, I think that's really clearly explained, and it's great to see how, you know, A to B led to C, and in fact, if you have C, you can get back to A as well, too, between the decoders as well. So I think most people, if you've ever been in a Tesla, for example, you understand the output on the, on the right. It shows you little, you know, avatars of cars driving past you and people and bicycles, yeah. etc. as well, too, and based on obviously all the cameras that it has as that input. And, you know, that's exactly what's going on in, in, in real time. Um, and exactly. so the image recognition led to image generation, that training, exactly. that decoder episode. 
when we get into what most people were familiar with when I talked about, you know, ChatGPT coming on the scene, you know, back in 2022, uh, text generation, what's different with text generation then? Well, uh, the thing is that text is a little bit different than the image because mm -hmm. for the, uh, if you get the image, uh, you have always the predefined resolution. For instance, this is one of the features. Sure. You know what it is. This is a set of pixels, which means the set of numbers. If you would like to generate an image using this kind of strategy, it's like something that we missed in that point for image generation is that okay. how the diffusion model works. So it basically works in the same way as an encoder decoder architectures. And the concept is very like, maybe it's not simple, but conceptually simple because images are numbers. For example, uh, all the uh, architectures, which are the basis for uh, mid journey, stable diffusion and other solutions mm -hmm. like that, or DALI, whatever, are based on this, on the, I think it was the most genius idea in that world, is that mm -hmm. if you get an image of a cat, for instance, like, like in this example, mm -hmm. and then you, add a noise on top of the image many times, like let's say 20 times, you mm -hmm. end up with a noisy image, absolutely noisy. You don't see that it was a cat. And there was a question, if we train the network giving a cat images and the noise images, which was generated from the cat image at the end, are you able to predict what kind of noise was added to that image? Of course you are, because you mm -hmm. have a, magic machine, which is an encoder and decoder, and you can train it using, this is a noisy cat image, and this on the output, this is the noise that was used. And you have hundreds of thousands or millions of these kind of examples. So you can give it a noisy image and it will detect what kind of noise was used. But it was a continuation of that concept. What if I, give or I, if I put to that network a noise, absolutely random noise. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And it it was trained on millions of images or hundreds of thousands of images. It should detect what noise was added to what, to a clear noise, but mm -hmm, it will mm -hmm. try to do so. Mm -hmm. So then you take the noise, then you subtract the predicted noise from the noise, and you should end up with something like a dog with three heads or something like that because <laughs> it's it's just a you know it's, it's just a simple thing if you have a noisy image where you don't see a cat at all then it doesn't make any difference if it's a noisy image of a cat or if it's just noise so you mm -hmm. can try to predict what noise was added of course in in the diffusion models uh you have a little bit different things because you have a random noise you have a nice predictor you have a predicted noise, then you subtract the predicted noise from the random noise, and you have an image. But it doesn't work like that, of course. It works like you have a random noise, but you have a prompt as well. Mm. So mm -hmm. there is a nice technology that tries to steer the noise predictor and push it towards what you actually said in the prompt. This is a little bit, well, a lot of maths in, in between. But the thing is that what you actually do, you say, this is my noise please generate an image out of it. So try to predict what noise was added to that noise. Mm -hmm, but take mm -hmm. into consideration that I'm saying it's a, you know, it's a nice dog uh, on the snow, for instance. But again, you predict the noise you subtract and you have a final image. But when you speak about text is different because mm -hmm. what you have to do, you have to think about words which are not numbers. These are not pixels at all. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. the thing is, that what you have to do first is you have to change the words or sentences into numbers. And this is a big deal because uh, imagine a word bank. It might have a number in a dictionary, but if you say bank robbery and river bank, it means different mm -hmm. things. <laughs> what is more, if you have a word street and word road, there are different words, but mean pretty much the same thing. Mm. So. Uh, we use for that so-called embeddings models, which are used in here as well. In fact, embeddings models 
currently are a, I will simplify things. It's a half of the GPT uh, like models. A mm -hmm. half, I mean, GPT models are encoder decoder. So it's an encoder only of the GPT uh, model. And what it does, its purpose is to return the vector or the array of numbers which represent the meaning of a given word or a sentence. Not its you know, numeric value of alpha, alphanumeric characters used in the sentence, but the meaning of it. It's of course trained in, on, a, on a lot of examples, but still it might be used here uh, to represent uh, the meaning of a sentence. And then we are able to compare things because the embeddings model are, you can imagine it as a, like for instance, imagine a three dimensional space and you have calculated the embedding of a given word like street and mm -hmm. embedding of a, a word like a road and they should be very close to each other in that space because they mean pretty much the same thing. Uh, but the problem is that the space is not three dimensional but usually the space currently used is something like 1,500 and more dimensions. So it's pretty difficult to manage that and to, well, to manage them, to visualize <laughs> that. And of course, uh, we calculate not the embeddings of a word usually, but of the sentence, it's a sentence level embedding. So to, but this is just a beginning of, well, you, you mentioned at the very beginning, the retrieval augmented generation. When you mm. look for something in the vector search, what we do is actually we are comparing the embedding calculated from our question with the embedding calculated of the content that we have in a database. And we look for the similar or the closest examples, closest vectors in math mathematical terms. I will not touch math here. <laughs> a couple of ways to do that. As, as soon as we get into n-dimensional space, it becomes very hard yeah. to visualize. <laughs> and and the, the only thing that helps me kind of get my own head around this is that you know computers are only good with numbers uh, and that's why we've got to do the embeddings essentially because yes we've got to change the meaning of words and the meaning of pictures the semantics of words the semantics of pictures into something that a computer can understand and a computer has no problem whatsoever thinking in you know as you say 1600 exactly. dimensions and that's you know that's how this works and it's all very easy to get you know wrapped up in you know like you know it's too large i can't understand it i don't know why and i think mm -hmm. the key thing is you touched on at the end there is we create our data and we run it through you know, we create the embeddings which gives that data a whole series of numbers that represents the meaning of that data and we store that and in mongodb we've got mongodb vector search so we store that embeddings yep. data alongside the original data so you say you know say i've got a database that's full of movies for example and i want to search uh, for a movie that's a romantic movie or something it mightn't say that in the title of the movie but it will be there in the meaning of the description of the movie and that's what embeddings does and gives back so We've got plenty of examples of people using vector search. Say, I'm looking for a romantic movie of a couple in mm -hmm. New York, and it will turn back Harry Met Sally or something like that, because it knows yeah. that. And neither New York nor romantic or anything might be in the description. But you know what? It's inferred that from what's happened with the embeddings. So I think, Christoph, you have come across really well in explaining what's a super hard topic for most people. We use these tools, but we don't get into the maths, as you say. Yeah. But this has been... The thing you is, know, that there is one, one, one important thing here, because we usually, when speaking about embeddings in the context of image generation or text generation or even text understanding, because it's used everywhere and it's used also in, uh, like, a, I could say, in good old recurrent neural networks which were used mm -hmm. for many or are used for many many years um, in translation for instance but embeddings is a general concept so you can imagine that you can create or calculate an embedding out of images and then you end up with a so-called a multimodal search where mm. you can search in the same way as you uh, as you try to try to search uh, um, Halimat Sali or, or 
uh, or any other romantic movie. I'm not good at romantic movies, so <laughs> sorry for what, what, mixing the title. What, what movie genre? Sci-fi, so, so, space stuff? <laughs> La, <laughs> rather criminal movies, but <laughs> <laughs> criminal. Let, let's let's stick to to Shawshank Redemption, for instance. So if you Perfect. would like to search for these kind of movies, then you can also use, for instance, this multimodal search using its thumbnail or even mm -hmm. the video itself, or a part of the video. Embedding is just an universal concept that uh, behind that concept is we would like to make numbers out of the meaning of something. Mm -hmm. You can have an embedding of the audio file. But when speaking about the translations or the language things, we usually use embeddings in the context like you said, but also we use them, for instance, in recurrent neural networks when creating uh, translation. This is just the same thing as for images because, well, mm -hmm. changing image into image and sentence into sentence is pretty much conceptually the same thing. But again, there is one additional layer, which is an encode, which is an calculating embedding out of the, out of the input sentence. And then you put that into the recurrent neural networks. It's recurrent because in fact, it's, it's not like that. It's not that every word has its own neural network here in the middle. In mm -hmm. fact, it looks like this is a recurrent neural network and you have the input here, but then the so-called the hidden state, here, we, here you have output, output which you can discard, but uh, the so-called hidden state goes back here. And this is recurrent. Uh, but the thing is that if you imagine this kind of tool to make translation or generate things, because recurrent neural networks could generate uh, texts very mm -hmm. well. But this is there is one problem with that, is that if you imagine that you have to put first word and then calculate the hidden state, make it go back into the input and then add the new word and then again calculate the hidden state, like in this image, this is like, Mm -hmm. unfolded, mm -hmm. then uh, you, uh, we, we can uh, at once see that this process is sequential. So we have to put first word, wait, second word, mm -hmm. wait, third word, wait, and so on. So training process is very, very long for recurrent neural networks. And okay. it could be a, of, of the same quality of uh, like the large language models but the training could last uh, last for years to get the same quality. So the okay. solution okay. that was behind LLM was to, you know, to solve the problem of sequential learning and to make it more parallel. This this was the problem. Okay, so that's why you know this this wouldn't be suitable for long sentences. It's going to take too long. It's yeah. going to take forever, right? Okay. Well, th there is one more problem with long sentences here is that because you have to wait for the hidden states here, mm -hmm. you know, the hidden states sent to the other, uh, or to the same neural net, um, a recurrent neural network uh, component, but in fact, it's a hidden state. The more words you put in the beginning, it tends to forget the first word, words because the so-called okay. intermediate representation is too simple. So okay. if you have a sentence starting with don't, and then something, if it forgets about the initial don't, you might have problems. So yeah, it's, yeah. It's, it's, it's a little bit difficult to say. So what we try to do, or, or what we, uh, I said, if as if it was myself uh, delivering the architecture. So the um, scientists in 2017, as far as I remember, published the art architecture which said, uh, with the title, attention is all you need. And this architecture changed the architecture of the neural network upside down because it said, okay. if we suffer from the sequential training, mm -hmm, then mm -hmm. we should probably do something else and we should get rid of this sequential training at all. And we should probably think only about one important component in the network, which is usually added here on top. Mm -hmm. uh, it's called attention. The attention means basically how the given specific words are connected with each other in the sentence. Like if you have a long sentence, it doesn't mean that the 
words connected with each other, related to each other, might be very close in the sentence. Okay. Uh, so you have to measure or train the network to learn the connection between words. And they said, we don't want this at all. Let's forget right. about this sequential training. Let's keep mm -hmm. only this attention mechanism. Nothing more. That's why it's attention is all you need. It's a little bit exaggerated. It's not that you need only attention, but still this was the concept be, be, uh, behind um, uh, the modern architecture called uh, generative pre-trained transformers. And that's the shortcut GPT. Ah, there you go. So we've come full circle now. So, and, 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 you know, had, so that was 2017 when they, you know, did turn this upside down on its head. So how did that spawn, you know, that rise in GPTs and, and all of the, you know, how is it solved with large language models? Uh, well, the thing is that we first need to think what large language model is, in fact. And so uh, the GPT architecture was based on the self-attention mechanism and the self-attention mm -hmm. can be pictured like that. Imagine that we have a sentence, I want to go home. I don't want, but still, this is an example. Mm. The thing is that if we would like to, the self-attention means that we want to calculate something, a number that represents how these words are connected to each other in the given sentence. This mm -hmm. was the task uh, or the challenge that, they, that the scientists had in 2017. Okay. Mm -hmm. So how can we measure that? We can train a network that given a lot of different texts, lots of lots of text, which cannot be used in recurrent neural networks, but because we don't have sequential training here, we could parallel in, in parallel put a lot of sentences to training and the mm -hmm. network has to learn how these words are connected with each other in the given context. So at the end, you end up with a network that actually can calculate the connection between any word in the dictionary. So you have a full mesh. You can imagine this as a full mesh of words or mm -hmm. full mesh of more than one word, like what we call the bigrams or uh, even more. Mm -hmm. So you have a full mesh of words and every word is connected with, each, with the other word in the dictionary and has a so-called an attention score calculated, but not this is not only one number. This is an attention okay. score that depends on the context in which these two words appear in a sentence. This was the concept of the large language model and what it does in training process and in then in, in so-called an inference. So when we use it, it's just calculating the attention scores between first word and the others second okay. word and all the others, third word, all the others. And it ends up with a network that is able to calculate the probability of the, or maybe not the probability, but it calculates the words or outputs the words that are most uh, possible to, uh, to appear in the given context. So if I say something like, uh, the president of the United States is, so the next word proposed by the network will be probably Joe. And mm. then it goes with the autoregression way. So it goes to the input. And now we have a sentence, the current president of the United States is Joe, and it will probably add Biden and so on and so on. That's why uh, sometimes uh, you have some kind of funny examples of how to use, let's say, chat GPT. Mm, because the GPT networks or any model you use, either it's an Amazon Bedrock uh, available models like Anthropic Cloud or Jurassic mm -hmm. from A21 mm -hmm. Labs or uh, Amazon Titan or Gemini or whatever, you have some kind of parameters that you can manipulate the behavior of a network. One of them is a temperature. And the temperature says, okay. I want to be very deterministic. So if I say, the president of the United States, it will return me Joe. Mm -hmm. But I can also steer the network to return not the most probable word, but the second or the third. And it will mm -hmm. probably say something like, the president of the, the United States is unicorn. 
but that then impacts the next words in the sentence. So you might end up with a nice creative hallucinations if you know what, how to use these parameter, parameters to, you know, to trigger the behavior uh, of the GPT network. But that's yeah. basically the, the seen, sense of how it works. Yeah, we've all seen those examples of the hallucinations. And I think, you know, that's why some people are, are in many ways doubtful of, of what comes out of the GPT sometimes too. But as you yeah. say, you can, you know, you can trigger them in a certain, not trigger them, but certain words will trigger those types of hallucinations or certain sentences will can trigger those. And as you say, it's, it's, you know, going back to the weightings that we talked about in the neural networks, it's, it's taking the full sentence, put the last word and the relationship of the last word to what's going to be the next word. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, exactly. It's, it's, and basically the architecture is again, encoder, which encodes the input sentence and decoder, which is trained on the, what we actually expect as the output. And then it works like that. That's why you, uh, sometimes people uh, think that if you speak with, uh, speak, or if you chat with, a, for instance, chat GPT, then mm -hmm. the words appear one after another. And that this is a visual effect. It's not, it's how it works because it mm -hmm. just adds the next word to the context uh, all the time. And, by the way, this is the most, this is the biggest disadvantage of uh, uh, large language models as, as of now. They are very slow and very compute uh, expensive computing. So you, you have to have a lot of resources to make it work correctly and fast. Uh, and anyway, they are very slow because they add up a, con uh, a con context all the time. So the context get lengthy, uh, but you have, billions of parameters and mm, billions of mm. parameters means means i'm changing the word into its embedding so first i need to calculate the embedding then i then i need to make a lot of matrix multiplications in the middle of the network and then calculate the next word and so on and so on so on. that's why it's very uh expensive right now yeah and look i mean we could fill an entire show about the cost of these GPTs yeah. and embeddings and large language models as well too. And depending on what blogs or websites you read, you know, it could be, you know, it's an enormous cost in, I suppose we're saying, look, we're going to put the, we're going to put our creativity onto computers, but the computers themselves yeah. are processing, as you say, billions, you know, they don't run on free energy. They don't, they're not caught free. They're sitting exactly. in large data centers. There's an entire, I suppose, concept around how much are we extolling back to the to the, you know, the AI, the Gen AI models, and how much are we offloading, you know, very very difficult tasks actually onto them without paying any attention to, you know, the energy consumed, the compute consumed, exactly. and everything consumed exactly. in, in relation to coming up with those basic answers. And I know everybody likes typing things into chat gpt and other tools to see what it comes back with and even stable diffusion and the other image generators as well um but there's a lot of behind the scenes things that happen there as well too so i suppose that you're touching on it there like that parallel processing the work that's involved the scale i think a lot of people um you know consider that there's some large language models out there and you know that they should just all use those, but there's specialized large language models there too that people could pick and choose, yep. you know, in the medicine space and the scientific world, et cetera, yep. as well too. But there's also retrieval augmented generation, Christoph, where you can leverage the large language model, but add your specialization on top. Could you tell our viewers a little bit about how they might leverage that? Because that's probably how most people are going to be interacting yes. with at least text-based Gen AI. Yes, this is the, the most common scenario in today's world because, uh, well, it gives you the opportunity to make some kind of uh, tools for uh, question answering or chatbots or specialized chatbots. And the concept actually is very simple because the model has its built-in knowledge. You can utilize that. But if you have your custom knowledge, uh, like your Confluence pages or your Wikipedia or 
whatever what is proprietary to you or to your organization, you have to like train, let's say it, it's not training, but let's say you, you have to train the model to know these things, additional things. Mm -hmm. We can do it two ways. We can either fine tune the models, which means basically delivering the knowledge and letting the mechanism to retrain the network or add a new layer of the neural network on top. But that's costly, uh, takes quite a long time and you have to mm -hmm. update uh, the training process when uh, you have to repeat the training, the fine tuning process whenever the new knowledge appears. Uh, that's why people use RAGS because it's much simpler in realization. And in fact, what you do is you try to get the correct knowledge from your vector store using embeddings and vector mm -hmm. search. And then you, when getting it out of the vector store, you put uh, this retrieved con context into the prompt. So you say mm -hmm. something like, here is the knowledge. And then you put something, what you got from the database. It doesn't have to be vector store, to be honest. It might be a full text search. In fact, the hybrid search is most often used where you where you utilize the power of vector search and power of full text search at the same time. So you then put the context and then you ask the same question. How can I do something which is my proprietary knowledge? And that's all. The biggest problem with RAGS is what I can see right now is the relevance of the context found. Because mm -hmm. when we discuss the things with embeddings, so how do you store these embeddings in your database? It means that uh, you are storing the vectors or the embeddings of the given portion of a text. Hmm. So this is just a point in the multidimensional space. If you ask something, you calculate the embedding as well, and you try to find the, let's say, three or five closest points in the multidimensional space. They might be far away, but still there are some closest points. That means that you might, uh, let me give you an example. I, I, I've made this kind of, uh, mm, let's say exercise here in mm -hmm. Zebia for, for a couple of guys. And it was like, I want to make a rack on top of two books. One is Shawshank Redemption and Rita Hayward. And the second one is the Silence of the Lambs. Mm -hmm. And I added first to the knowledge base, the Shawshank Redemption. And the question was, who is Andy Dufresne? And the answer was correct. But if I asked it, who is Hannibal Lecter? Although the model knew it, it returned me the information, I don't know, because I haven't found that in the context. But in okay. fact, it has found some context, but then measured the relevancy of the context and said, well, I found these points in the multidimensional space, but they are not relevant to the question. That's the most important and most difficult thing in uh, RACS. True, true. And, and, and I suppose, look, that's, it's, Important to point out the, not necessarily the deficiencies, but where things may not work. And the other side of, say, not doing RAG, but requires more work is fine tuning, right? Yeah. So, like I said, fine tuning is, well, it's an alternative, of course, and you might mm. get better results with fine tuning because you just deliver the knowledge directly to the network you might use. Uh, direct fine tuning where you or full fine tuning where you actually retrain all the weights or all the parameters of the network, which might by what might by the way lead to a so called a catastrophic forgetting. So the model will forget what it what it knew before. Or you can use a parameter efficient fine tuning, so PIFT, a P E F T, F P E F T, which means that you add only a layer, an adapter layer on top of the model, and it's trained like in, in a specialized way for a given model. The model must be fine-tunable to, to be able to implement that. But as I said, this process is expensive, uh, lengthy, and you have to repeat that all the time if the new knowledge appears, which of course is a trade-off. Either you have something more expensive and less convenient, but more accurate, but with racks, well, we can obtain what we want. Uh, actually, there are lots of things. Uh, out there on the market that work greatly, like Amazon Bedrock, for instance. Uh, mm -hmm. And the thing is that the, the, the trick is in the prompt. Mm. So it's, it's always there. And that's the thing, I suppose, we've seen, you know, the, 
the rise of the prompt engineers, for example, trying exactly. to get the best out of these systems. I've seen commentators say, you know, particularly say for code completion tools such as AWS Code Whisperer, et cetera, that mm -hmm. English is the new coding language. Because if you can construct a, a good prompt or a good comment, those code assistance tools will give you back the lines of code you need to complete your task. So yes. I, Th More or less, yes. Al although I do, I disagree that it will remove software developers from the picture. I mean, it could not replace them because it's an indeterministic tool, while coding is fully deterministic. So, if you can try to debug a code, then it's pretty simple. But please try to debug the prompt, which returns usually the same things, but not always. You're not guaranteed, mm -hmm. and it's it's lengthy. It can have Couple of work, a couple of pages of uh, of uh, a normal documents to, to be very uh, precise, and then you have to debug it. How would you do it? Would you do mm. it? So it, it's not that simple. No, it's not. I mean, and I I'm totally on board that camp, Christoph, with with the not replacing developers. I think it yeah. takes some of the mundane or tedious things off developers. But again, you need a, yeah. a level of knowledge to understand how and when to leverage it. Um, but one thing for sure, and I suppose as we kind of, I, I, you know, we've gone to the top of the hour, I think you've, you've, for me, you've illustrated the path from where we've come all the way back from the neural networks all the way through to right up to date with the large language models and the GPTs. I suppose looking forward, you know, taking a, a futuristic view and your experience in this space for quite a while and, and, you know, having done your PhD in this way, you know, where do you see this ultimately heading? You know, are we going to be able to, is there going to be millions of large language models or three or four going to win out? Is there going to be, you know, all tools that we go to? It's kind of, I think a lot of the time, you know, when we see there's lots of search companies back in the day all over the place, then certain larger search companies win out and everybody just defaults to those. Are certain larger LLMs and embeddings going to, going to win out as yeah. well too? Or is there always going to be nuances that we need to take care of? Well, uh, I'm not a fortune teller, so I cannot tell you directly <laughs> what will happen. But what uh, th the thing is that I always say that software engineering world is out of, is like naturally tending to monopole to monopoles. Like for instance, if you are speaking about containerization, then you have Kubernetes and pretty much nothing else. Mm -hmm. If you have containers, you have Docker, uh, and so on. So we tend to think about the solutions as we are looking for the best one, and we all use it. Of course, in LLMs, it's not that. Uh, you, you have quite a lot of models that are working well. Of course, usually, if you, if you look at the market, then you have, I don't know, seven, maybe eight of these, model, of these companies that are doing the models that, that, that really are doing their job on the market. For instance, like Gemini, like, like GPT-4, or Cloud, Jurassic, and uh, Meta Llama 2, uh, mm -hmm. Amazon Titan, and maybe uh, Mistral, but uh, maybe Cohere command as well. But the thing is that there are only a couple of them, and because training is very expensive, it's not that easy to get into that market. So probably what, what I see for the future is that we will, tr we will start to pay attention to energy consumption. And uh, mm. the thing is that we, in most cases, we don't need these large language models at all. We need what, uh, what they call it is a small language models, which are mm. much, much smaller, much more energy and computing, uh, compute efficient or cost efficient as well. And, but they do what they are designed for. So they are sometimes referred as small language models, but of course we can do a, uh, small language models that were trained on some specific content, like you mentioned, the medicine things, and you have mm -hmm. the task specific models. So you, you will get the right tool for the job. So maybe there will be quite a lot of models designed by uh, smaller companies or the new companies on the market that will be specializing in the specific models that are applicable for the given tasks. But the thing is that I, for the future, I 
I'm trying to think a little bit further than than just you know a couple of months or uh, a couple of months in front of us. But uh, so I think about two things. Uh, one of them was mentioned by Jan Lekun, uh, and it it is about so-called planning, because the problems, uh, as I mentioned before, the problem with uh, uh, GPT architectures or the large language models is that they are slow. Mm. They are slow because they are working in an autoregressive manner. So uh, every word is uh, every new generated word is actually sent to the input, and uh, planning is just a concept of creating bigger portions of text in one shot. So it's not that the network will generate one word after the other, but will generate the whole text at, at once. It will be much more efficient, but it requires new architecture. And again, a mindset change, like uh, the attention is all you need. So there must be some brilliant idea uh, coming up. Uh, and the second thing that I see for the future is so-called state space models. A state mm -hmm. space model is basically a statistical concept quite, quite old, but uh, uh, it is quite often referred right now for the autonomous robotics. Because okay, okay. Think, think, think of the uh, large language models. How, how do they actually work? Is that you have a sentence, you change it into embedding, and you try to predict the next word. But then after predicting the next word, it tries to predict the next and the next. So if we change these things into, let's say, a human-shaped robot, mm -hmm. then you can measure its position in the physical three-dimensional world, world, and you can give it a task. You can trigger it by a prompt, like, do me a favor and open the door. And it might do autonomously what it's asked for. It's not programmed to open the, the door it will try to find the way to do it. It's a different mm -hmm. thing. It's like an autonomous generation of a text, but then it's not in the word di dimensions or the sentence dimension. It's in the three-dimensional physical dimensions. The only problem with that, well, it's not the only problem, but the most, the biggest problem of that is that large language models are universal. The knowledge is all over the world in Wikipedia, in books, in mm -hmm. in every place. While if you would like the robot to open you a door, you have one type of door, I have the other ones, so you cannot train it universally. It will always work in a different way. But this is something that probably will come up in in the future. I'm waiting for that. Uh, I'm don't I don't expect to, you know, T thousand terminators uh, coming <laughs> here and and the time travels because it's just a stochastic machine. So something that returns indeterministic results, random results, in fact. Uh, but still, I'm, I'm looking forward to do these things uh, 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 quite well. And, and going back to what you were saying, too, about GPTs being quite slow in this state space scenario, whereby you're asking your robot assistant to do something. Exactly. You don't want them to go off and figure that out. You need that small language model embedded in the robot to make sense of what you just yep. asked, right? Yeah. Or create then... a robot that will have, you know, a lot of GPUs on board <laughs> or something like that. Yeah. So we are waiting for the new architecture. That's for sure. And that will probably come, but I don't know when. Probably uh, lots of scientists are working on that constantly trying to overcome the, 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 the difficulties like they did with the recurrent neural networks and develop the GPTs. So we just have to wait. Yeah, yeah. We got um, a number of questions came in while you were talking. And I know, Monty, you had a couple of questions for probably for me, um, but I'm not great at multitasking at the moment. I need to look at some of those. But we did get one in, which I think comes up time and time again, essentially with regard to you know, misuse of generative AI and the concerns around that, deep fakes and everything else. What's mm -hmm. your view on that, Christoph? Uh, well, you know, first of all, let's take a realistic view. This is just a tool and it can mm -hmm. be used in a good way or in a bad way. That's always true for everything we do. You can have software that makes 
uh, bad things, the same thing you can have with these tools. So uh, there are a lot of methods to prevent mm, the, let's say, bad behavior of mm -hmm. LLMs. Like for instance, if you implement your application, you can evaluate or fine tune a model. You can evaluate its toxicity, for instance, or different kind of measures are used for that. But if someone is able to create an application that makes deep fakes on top of the uh, video generating uh, uh, models, well, he'll be able to do that. And that's not something we could fight efficiently with, like with, you know, lots of things like spamming emails, like, you know, lots of bad things. Of course, I think that this is a danger for uh, uh, for artificial intelligence in general, but this is a danger for the technology in general as well. So if you have a phone, you can have your phone infected by a malicious software. In the same thing, you can have a software that generates a fake, deep fake uh, video of Tom Cruise speaking something very badly. So, well, I'm, you know, I'm realistic. I'm not very emotional about that. I'm just trying to avoid these kind of things. The only thing that worries me sometimes is that more and more texts are generated using chat GPT and similar tools. And we have to find ways to detect the real text uh, that is not generated by GPT for two reasons. The first reason is that you uh, have to create a tool that really detects the plagiarism. But the second thing is that mm -hmm. the tools or the new models will learn on top of the pr generated the previously generated text. So if the GPT-5 will learn using the text generated on GPT-4, it will degrade in quality. So we have to avoid that. And that's problem, that's challenging. Yeah, that's a very salient point, I suppose. Look, as we know, um, the models for the various GPTs, some of them were you know, rooted in a period of time and they're getting more and more current as we get new ones out there as well too but we're creating so much data every day and if half of this yeah. data is now being created by ai and exactly. some of that's got the hallucinations we we see that we see the hallucinations in the text that you saw i think anybody who's played around with the image mm -hmm. generator see the extra fingers or the third hand and it's useless at text in images as well too generating that property spellings it messes up uh, quite a lot as well too. It's great at creating an image, but you ask it to name something in the image or a building called X, Y, or Z. Sometimes you can totally see that spelled cor incorrectly as well too. And if that surfaces up as the corpus of training for the new exactly. uh, LLMs go forward, yeah, who knows? Who knows? That's why that's happen. that's why the 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 models that generate images often add watermarks to the mm -hmm. images, mm -hmm. and you can detect if the image was created by a model or not. I don't mean the visible watermark. I mean the watermark that is yes. only detectable by the tools developed by the owner of the model. So it, it might be very useful to detect these kind of things to avoid retraining on the same things. Yeah, and I and I think that's a really important point. Uh, as you say, it's it's not just the, the watermark in the image. It's, in, it's embedded in the file of the image that if you try to take that to exactly. teach one of the models again, it, it will it will certainly pop out as well too, um, yeah. And just trying to scan through, um, Monty. We will take care of your questions. I think they're too specific at the moment, and probably a bit future looking as well too for some of the product developments here at MongoDB. But um, certainly getting into the right space for us. So very much thank you, thank you for that. Um, any final words for our audience? Like, where do you go to keep on top? Of, of kind of your knowledge in this space, Christoph? Where, where do you go to learn? How do you keep on top of it? Because that's one of the hardest things that I find. Mm -hmm. We, yeah. you know, I deal with a lot of AI stuff and from a developer relations point of view here at MongoDB, we have an artificial intelligence Slack channel that I cannot keep up with, with everything that's been posted in there by the rest of the team here in, in the wider MongoDB company. How do you keep up to date or how do you keep abreast of the new changes and, and everything that's been released in this space? Uh, I must say it's difficult because the, mm. the the problem is, or my problem, my internal problem is that I don't want, I, I don't like only to use things. When I try, when I touch something, 
I try to understand how it works under the hood. And it's difficult to, to keep up with every innovation that is in that world. But in fact, I'm usually using uh, medium or towards data science com, dot com uh, pages because there are lots of brilliant articles about things like how RAC really works or how fine tuning works or how self attention works in a simple world. So this is my source of knowledge, how things work. But I also try to keep up with the tooling that appears on the market, specifically because I'm a AWS oriented. Uh, I'm uh, trying to experiment with Bedrock and there is something or in one additional thing that it's on top of racks because when we use racks, then we assume that the knowledge is in, stored in a vector store. But if you want to make, a, let's say, a chatbot that answers you to the mm -hmm. questions like, was the temperature now in Tokyo, then you cannot use Rack because you cannot deliver the knowledge to the vector store every five minutes for every point in the world. It's not possible. So you there need is a deep concept pockets of, as well, too, if you wanted to try and do that, if you're going to have to run yeah, that. Yeah, exactly. Keep that up to date, exactly. right? It's expensive. So, so the idea is that conceptually that if you ask what's the weather in Tokyo, that the model will ask some external service providing the information about weather in a different points of, uh, of the world uh, and will answer you with that. Of course, it doesn't work like that because model does mm -hmm. not communicate with the external world, but you can create an agent, which means that you create a speci specific prompt uh, in which the model will return you the information. What should you do to mm -hmm. get that information uh, from the external world. It's very interesting and the uh, uh, prompts that are used there are super complex. Uh, the more tools available you have, uh, the more difficult it is. But it's like tr an attempt to change the typical conversational bot into an intent-based bot. Like we had, mm -hmm. a, I want to order a pizza, what size it is, and so on. But then you define something in the past, you define something very deterministic. This is a bot that can you answer you with or respond to you with the weather in a given point uh, uh, on the map. But mm -hmm. now you would like to make a conversational bot that can do multiple things at the same time or answer the knowledge with RAC, answer with its own built-in knowledge or call the external services to get additional information. And Bedrock actually uh, supports this kind of orchestration and this is something that I would like to uh, dive deeper because uh, uh, this is the future of, I think, of using the potential of LLMs. Because racks are, you know, uh, everyone does racks right now, but not everyone can do agents right now and make a real process automation with the use of LLMs. Yeah, I, I think agents is one of the key areas that I'm really excited about how that Yep. you know transforms this space so you know what we've touched on so far is you know I, I can query you know large documents with rag and get back sensible answers it can do certain things for me but agents is going to be more powerful because they'll actually go off and do a series of processes for you in a series thing exactly. and they'll debug in the middle they'll cope with their errors in the middle as well too if they're done properly as you say and uh, they need to be architected properly they're, they're you know they are quite complicated but i think that's right. the next space for all of this transformational change that we're, we're seeing today i think um look we've covered a lot we went through all the way from neural networks and predictions and everything else uh, all the way right up to to filters, and I loved how you explained how the filters worked within the images, and then explained how we did that in reverse to teach things and to create image generation. So all about that uh, convolutional neural networks. Christoph, this has been um, an eye opener for me. I loved our conversation. I loved our chat. I know our audience did too, because so many of them stayed for the full duration of our conversation, which is always a good indicator that we're keeping them interested, we're keeping them on point. Um, I think for those that want to test out more and play with more, MongoDB is, let me say this, agnostic in, in the Gen AI space. So we work with all of our partners, all of the cloud products, all of our tech partners as well too, because Atlas Vector Search that we have allows us to do that. And if you've got your data already on MongoDB, you can create a vector index and you can vectorize all your data using whatever LLMs and embeddings that you want. 
and stored alongside your data. And as we say in MongoDB, the data that's accessed together should be stored together. So that's our secret sauce, as it were. But if you go to that link there or just search for Atlas Vector Search, you'll see actually a lot of our details about our AI integrations and examples as well, too. So uh, do check that out if what Christoph has gone through here in our conversation today has whetted your appetite to, as you say, understand things a bit better, you know, not just use things, but understand how they work. You can see um, that we've got some good links there as well, too. Any last comments for our audience then, Christoph, before before I let you go? And and as I said, to me, this has been super insightful. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure to be here and to explain things because in my in the middle of my heart, I'm I'm a, I'm a teacher. My wife always says that I missed something and I should have been a teacher in a school. Uh, so, uh, well, it, it was a great pleasure to be here to speak with you and explain things, answer questions. Uh, my last thought is the only thing that we should do to be competitious to LLMs is to learn faster than them. <laughs> I, I think so. Uh, well, keep one step ahead, right, uh, in terms yeah. of the space and our knowledge in this. And I think you're right. And, and and your wife is a very wise woman because you come across really well as a teacher. This is a this is a super complicated topic. And as I said, the demos and things that we've done before, we're showing how things work. We haven't dived into how they were, you know, what the inception was, how they were created, how, you know, the 40, 50 years of machine learning knowledge has got us to where we are today. And I think you painted a super clear picture of that. So thank you so much uh, for for thank your you. time and your attention. And my uh, an old boss of mine used to say the reward for good work is more work. So I'm sure I'll have you back at some point <laughs> in the future With pleasure. <laughs> to talk about other things <laughs> that and other pro progress that we've made in this space. But for now, Christoph, from, from me and all the rest of the MongoDB team here, Thank you so much for joining us. For all our viewers, um, sorry we didn't get to all of your questions. I'm particularly thinking of Monty. I will figure out a way to answer your questions. And some of the things that you've mentioned there are on potential roadmaps for, for developments here as well, too. Um, so we're all going in the right space. Thank you to all our viewers who join us on LinkedIn and on YouTube. As I said at the beginning, please do like and subscribe to the MongoDB channel on YouTube. Um, and follow us on LinkedIn, and you'll get the notifications for future events. So, as I said, Cloud Connect is every Thursday with me, usually, um, but lots of my colleagues have other shows. We've got the MongoDB podcast live. We've got Learn With Loose and a whole host of other shows. So if you um, subscribe or follow on LinkedIn, you'll get notifications of where, how and when those are happening. But for me, Shane McAllister, uh, Christoph, thank you so much. This was so enlightening. I do appreciate your time and effort, and it was a great to have this conversation with you. And to all of our viewers, thank you very much. We hope to see you again soon, and do take care. <laughs>